Hello everybody and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mike's. Proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com where you can find cool stuff in stock every day and our co-sponsor CardHoarder.com offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. I'm Evan Irwin and we get started each top 10 by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Aaron Campbell. Aloha. Ruben Bressler. Oh hi, how are you? Great, how are you doing? Doing well. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. We're not going to be able to have a live show if only, like, it's a good thing half of Dominaria didn't just get spoiled. <laughs> right. Because, man, we no look stupid. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. I think I, Aaron, Aaron and I were talking about maybe I might guest on her stream because we're not going to guest on my stream because my computer is made of potatoes. <laughs> but we're Actual talking Idaho about Russets. maybe. Right, gotcha. Yeah, exactly. Idaho, Idaho Russetler. Um, <laughs> we, so we might, we might do something Wednesday. That'll be a spur of the moment thing, though. Fair yeah, enough. we'll see. We'll see. Like I said, I definitely, it's too cold for me to go to Legacy. Like, I love going to Legacy Night at my local game store, but I don't love it enough to brave, like, 20-degree weather. So, yeah, hanging out with Ruben and staying warm with maybe a burn deck is a possibility. So we'll see what there happens. Wow. Well, apparently it's going to be around the 40s over there in Nevada when I get there. Well, oh, that's, yeah. I mean, that's northern Nevada for you. I mean, that's, you know, you're you're an hour away from Tahoe where they're already in ski season. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it gets chilly up there. So you're going to go from Evan Irwin to Evan Berwin. Is see what I did there? Cool. Wow. Right. Russet. <laughs> Tater wrestlers. Okay. Yeah. Um, that said, we begin with our choice of the top comment from last week in a segment we call honorable mention. Well, Ruben will tell us who was the most luxuriant and letting us know what card we didn't choose as one of our top 10 masters, 25 cards, Ruben. Mm, luxuriant. Well, <laughs> the winner this week came from a unique source. It came from our Patreon comments. Uh, this is our first Patreon comment winner from Stephanie Mason, who writes, Loved the list, but I really want to draft this set, and the card I want to draft is Horseshoe Crab. Three mana for a 1-3 common crab with pay a blue, untap Horseshoe Crab. Doesn't sound scary until you remember that Retraction Helix is at common, letting you wipe away your opponent's board. And at uncommon, you have Quicksilver Dagger and Heavy Arbalist to draw cards and deal damage. That's such a fun, silly deck to put in a limited environment, and it makes me so excited to draft this format. Oh, I'll be man. honest, I didn't know that those cards were in the set until this comment <laughs> popped up. I, I was like, wait, Retraction Helix is in this set? That there's is actually a lot of broken. There's actually a lot of broken combos in this set that you can form. That's awesome. Straight up pickles, like actual yeah. pickles lock right in the but set. But this one's a common. Yeah. I mean, you can put the, you can, if you get the rare and the uncommon, that's pickles. But this is a couple of commons, so. Retraction Helix is common? That's what that's what it says. Wow! All right. Well, well, you live the dream, Stephanie. I am mad at you. <laughs> that, that sounds like super fun to me. Uh, and, and all the Masters formats limited have have often been you know praised as like it's sort of like cube draft, but in a different weird cube that you know you, you don't uh, you aren't 100 percent familiar with. Right. That said, uh, Stephanie, congratulations. Please get in contact with us uh, maybe over Patreon, for example. Sure. And we can get you your fifty dollars gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com, and obviously thanks to Cool Stuff for sponsoring the segment. Everyone to rock on to our top ten artifact creatures of all time, where we have we have some sames, we have some buyers. Speak for yourselves. I mean, it's <laughs> not, Aaron. We, there's not a ton of overlap. Aaron has has some, but no, we have. I one. have one. I have literally one same. Right. Or one higher. One, one higher. higher. I'm yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uno Uno higher. Well, uh, and, and it's funny because I'm running a poll right now. Uh, on Twitter, where I'm like, hey guys, you know, out of 695 options, <laughs> yeah. Ruben and I have chosen the same number four. Yeah, it's funny because going into this list, Ruben had made a comment in our Google Hangout. He was like, you know, we're probably going to have a bunch of same guys. There's not that many artifact creatures. And when I was forming my list, I was like, I have a lot to choose from. Like, I had a good list of like 25 to 30, and I had to really kind of whittle them down a little bit. And I felt I had a lot to choose from. There were a lot of good choices out there. I always think we're going to overlap because I always think that my choices are the correct choices. <laughs> oh, and yeah. then, no, but then, then I'm proven wrong. So you know, every episode, I'm like, oh, right. Why didn't I? do that well i guess there's there's uh there's some accounting for taste well we'll find out later in the episode but they were they are currently correct the poll yeah. is correct the, nice uh, two cards. when we get to number four we'll see if they're still correct absolutely <laughs> so that said i'm gonna go ahead and kick us off with uh my number 10 and my number 10 is honestly this one i gotta say is almost pure nostalgia there was a certain artifact creature. When I first started playing the game, we're talking back in the day with 4th edition, with Ice Age, Alliances had just come out, everyone's freaking out over stuff. 
creatures weren't good. I mean, creatures really, really, really weren't good. Um, but uh, creatures had been reprinted, artifact creatures, from antiquities into 4th edition. <clears throat> and there was one creature that I just played a ton with, and I really had a lot of fun with it. And it's just kind of mine for me. This isn't going to be on the greatest list or anything, but Yoshin Soldier oh. was so cool back in the day. I just, I loved it. I loved the picture. I thought it was amazing. Christopher Rush's art was awesome. It is, for those who don't know, it's originally from Antiquity. It's a three generic mana, one four with Vigilance. That's it, That's ladies it. and gentlemen. That was playable <laughs> in 1996, y'all. We didn't have much. That's a, that's a better horn turtle. That's uphill both ways of the magic variety. No, that's right. I didn't play with the Ocean Soldier. That's you kids, so you don't even know. But I love Ocean Soldier. It was just, it's, it's got a place in my heart. That's, that's why yeah. it's here. There are many. It like did it. get this a reprint. Mine. It did even get a reprint with new art uh, in Mirrodin. Um, did not see nearly as much play as artifact creatures had gotten slightly better by then. However. Um, yeah, yo I remember this art. The first time I saw this Yoshin Soldier art, and was like, "Wow, is that just an, a warrior ant? What's going on yeah. in this art?" Yeah, um, definitely, uh, definitely an old school fave. Yeah, super cool. And and when it came back in Mirrodin, it was okay and limited. I mean, you know, equipment suddenly existed, which made it yeah. a little bit better. That was nice. Lockstone Warhammer goes very well with it. But like all in all, this is a kind of a dinky, dorky little dude that. You know that I, that I enjoy a lot, and and we're gonna get some uh, some callbacks to the flavor that's in this flavor text of the Yo Yoshin and the Krug, uh, or the location of Krug. Now it's uh, a ruins, um, as we have this wall of flavor text on Yoshin Soldier talking about Urza defending Krug, and uh, I, I assume that we'll go see go see uh, uh, that area when we go back in a couple months. Yeah, it's it's crazy because you know there's nothing else to put on this thing but infinite flavor text because right. it doesn't do a lot. Sure. Vigilance. Woo, Ruben, what's your number 10? Uh, my number 10 is the only hire that I have on my list. Only one, huh? Yep. Okay, Aaron, what's your number 10? My number 10 is the embodiment of my list. You know, if I, if I had to say the thing that my cards have in common is that they're all over the top. This list is very over the top. And some of the things, some of the cards I have are over the top in terms of powerful. Like they're so like, what were they thinking? And then some of them are over the top just in terms of fun where they just slapped a bunch of abilities on there. Maybe they're just dripping with flavor and you just can't believe it. And my number 10 is, is a good starting point for this. Uh, this is a creature from Shadowmoor. Um, and, and I can really just sum the card up with three words. <clears throat> it's harvest time. <laughs> My number 10 is Reaper King. Um, so Reaper King is, you can either pay 10 colorless, or you can pay a white, a blue, a black, a red, and a green, if I'm understanding that correctly. Or some combination thereof. Or some combination So you can two. pay six red, black, or eight and a blue, yeah. or two colorless, blue, black, <laughs> red, green, any combo. It's whatever you're into. It's a legendary artifact creature, Scarecrow. It's a 6-6. Six, six. Um, and it says other Scarecrow creatures you control get plus one, plus one, because clearly there's so many of those out there that they needed a lord. Um, and then whenever another Scarecrow comes into play under your control, destroy target permanence. You just get vindicates every time you play a Scarecrow. Um, and the art is just grotesque. It's just this weird, hunched over. And this is actually a creature I understand from the Shadow More lore. This was a real card in the storyline. Yep. Um, and I love this. I love seeing all the commander decks that spring forth from this. You play cards like conspiracy and suddenly everything you have is, is is a scarecrow and you get to vindicate things and then there's all the change links from the shadow more block um and so you might scoff at this and think there aren't any actual or there aren't many actual scarecrows but there are a lot of things that do a very good scarecrow imitation and um this this card is just so much fun and it's just this is a good starting point to uh showcase the absurd cards that i have on my list <laughs> you know something i never actually noticed and i'm just finding here from a wiki entry the Reaper King's crown is featured as the expansion symbol for Shadowmoor. Yeah, yeah that, I knew that. That, that thing, I, I just never, I thought that was like a wing yeah. or something. I didn't, I didn't no, know what was going his, on there. It's his pumpkin head. I just what, love that art, though. It's so grisly. Like, oh, it's it is. Fantastic. It's very Golgari and just Very alive. evocative, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, you can, you can play it for six colorless green black if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly can. And luckily they made a whole set, you know, and a couple sets with creatures that had every creature type in them. Right. So you could trigger this maybe possibly so you're not, not one time during limit. Right. You're not you're not completely limited to just uh, changelings. There are, I mean, even beyond just the Shadow Moor expansions, which of course my favorite Scarecrow Painter Servant appeared in. Um, there are lots of other appearances. There's like the One-Eyed Scarecrow and the Wicker Witch, and a couple of cards got um, errated to be Scarecrows oh. uh, back in the day. Not not many, just a couple, like Straw Soldiers. Um, 
And so there's only maybe 25 or 30 scarecrows uh, beyond the changelings. But you can also play arcane adaptation. There are lots of ways that you can you can get your scarecrows and destroy permanents. If there were too many scarecrows, Reaper King would be way out of control, which way too powerful. But uh, definitely a good addition to the list. Well, back when they still had uh, Vanguard, and these days uh, there's there's not much Vanguard happening um, sure. beyond Momer Vig. But uh, there is a Reaper King Vanguard. I also yeah. found out uh, which it, each creature you control gets plus one plus one for each of its colors is its standard bonus. Wow. However, you get minus two to your hand size and minus five to your life. Yes. I'd, I'd pay that. So I'm five not cards, sure. yeah. 15 yeah. life start at? I don't know. That's pretty neat, though. Do you get to harvest then? Yes. Harvest time. That's right. <laughs> Moving here to number nine. Ruben, what's your number nine? My number nine is uh, one of only 11 creatures that are banned in Commander. Um, there are two artifact creatures banned in Commander, and you would think that the one that I would put at number nine would in fact be Painter's Servant, but it's not. Um, this card has new art for M25, it's in the Vintage Cube, there was a masterpiece made after it, and it is just a titanic artifact creature. My number nine is Sundering Titan. Yeah. So Sundering Titan originally was a card from uh, Darksteel. That re is a eight mana seven ten artifact creature golem. When Sundering Titan enters the battlefield or leaves the battlefield to destroy a land of each basic land type, choose a land of each basic land type, then destroy those. There we go. Figured it out. Um, this was a masterpiece. It had one of the more interesting uh, masterpiece arts of is sort of like a holding the artificers in its arms with its gristle brand hooks. <laughs> Um, it's one of the pieces of art uh, that is on the packaging for M25. People were wondering if this was going to be a Platinum Imperion or if it might be Blightsteel Colossus or some other giant Colossus of Sardia from back in the day. But no, it ended up being Sundering Titan. Still sees some play, not as much as it used to um, in, in some of those blue-white Tron decks or Tooth and Nail decks and things like that. Uh, just an iconic piece of art from way back in the day with sort of the the, the hooded uh, re uh, a reptilian kind of mechanical uh, uh, a piece there. Um, it's it's just a, a very interesting, cool uh, um, creature that's very unique also. I guess Global Ruin might be the only one that uh, – that, that is even close to Sundering Titan. Um, it's from From the Vault Relics. It's got its reprint in Masters 25, so it's got that clout. They've, they've, just gotten, it's... they've gotten plenty of versions of the thing. This card's a beating. Like, it's also yeah. a creature. This card's a straight, <laughs> actual, like, stomping. And there, yeah, there's so... a reason you've seen it. You, you've seen it You've seen it reprinted so many times, and I think it's on the packaging for a reason, because yeah. Sundering Titan is super cool. It's also seen play in any mud decks, uh, the Cloud Post decks and Legacy. Uh, it has seen play in Red Green Tron from time to time. I think it's very format, like it depends on the metagame. I actually sure. wouldn't be surprised to see Sundering Titan make a bit of a comeback because we're seeing modern kind of veer in a Jun, very greedy mana base kind of format. And nothing punishes people for playing multiple different kinds of lands than Sundering Titan. And so, um, you know, it makes a really good speed bump or a stop on the way to your Ulamogs and, and your Emrakuls and things like that. And so I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, it get getting more play and yeah i've certainly been on the receiving end before where it's like yay and even at its worst it's just a 710 like yeah. why <laughs> oh oops i right. just 710 you that's that's great well my my favorite thing to do with sundering titan is have an urborg in play and destroy one of my opponent's non-basic lands because uh like i'll destroy your academy ruins which is a swamp by the way oh. uh because of urborg with the sundering titan that's oh. a trick i've pulled off a couple of times nice the my number nine, unfortunately, is higher on someone else's list, so I don't have one. Aaron, Rats. what is your number nine? My number nine is extremely tongue in cheek. Um, I, I look at this card, I look at the art, and I just you just get the, you you just get the impression that this was made during a very different time in Magic's history. I can't imagine a card like this would ever be released now. Maybe in like an unset, but this was printed in like an actual set. This was printed in Dissension, um, and the card really doesn't do much, but it's just funny. Like it's just funny, and it drips with flavor. Uh, it's a bit of a play on words. Uh, it's a bit of a play on the term blonde bombshell. Um, my number nine is bronze bombshell. 
bombshell. Um, so bronze bombshell is four colorless. It's four power, one toughness, artifact creature construct. Uh, when a player other than bronze bombshell's owner controls it, that player sacrifices it. If the player does, bronze bombshell deals seven damage to him or her. And the flavor check says, ooh, shiny, let's pull off the chain and take her with us. And it says, gruel raider last words. <laughs> and the art features this very bodacious, this, this you know, uh, very um, beautiful looking golem, if you will. She's well strutting built. down the streets. Well built. Wow. She's strutting down the street and she has this long, very obvious chain behind her. Um, and it's just funny. Like, it's just the idea of this bombshell just walking down the street surrounding her and someone going, let's pull the chain. And then bam, they're gone. Like, I love everything about this. And yeah, I just, you know, we just wouldn't see this nowadays. You know, this is something that might be like in an unstable set. But, you know, to think that this is something that was a rare uh, in, in, a, yeah. in a major set, it just blows my mind. Oh, no pun intended. Because Wow. Lot, but <laughs> nice. Yeah. What a what a ridiculous card. Yeah. It's just a weird, silly type of thing. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's just strange to be like, that's one sexy golem. Like, I don't <laughs> yeah. really want to think that. That's strange. I don't I don't know. They, they well, gave this woman curves. This, this we're, we're we're getting those sex robots soon, so don't worry too much about it, Evan. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we'll, we won't hold our breath. Uh, that said, we're we'll moving on here to number eight. Ruben, do you have a number eight? I do. I do have a number eight. Um, in going through my list, you guys know that I value certain things pretty highly. I, I value uh, tournament clout, uh, tournament playability. I also value um, whether it's had like a, a, an appearance in the uh, Legacy or the Vintage Cube. Um, my number eight has neither of those things. Um, it's the only card on my list that has neither of those things. And But it does have uh, uh, some Pro Tour uh, playability. It's gotten second place in a couple of Pro Tours, most recently in the uh, Blue, Red, and Soul uh, artifact deck that was played by Mike Sigrist and uh, um, Berrios. So I think it's Sergio Berrios. Okay. Um, it was also played at uh, Pro Tour Born of the Gods by Sebast uh, uh, Sebastian Siebold in Modern Affinity. Um, it's a staple of Modern Affinity, as a matter of fact. And it's so iconic that it also has a masterpiece. My number eight is Ornithopter. Mm. Nice. Pretty simple. Pretty easy. <laughs> it's an O2 flying artifact creature Thopter for zero mana. Now, if I wanted to pick a zero mana creature that had a Pro Tour win, I would have picked Memnite because it won the Pro Tour in Tempered Steel. Ornithopter right. would have seen play in that deck had it been printed. This is where I'd have all my Ornithopters if I had any. Um, but <laughs> fairly odd parents call back there. Yeah. But it has been printed 15 times over oh. various sets and printings. It has its own masterpiece, as I mentioned earlier, going all the way back to Antiquities. Um, and it explains why it's been printed so many times in the flavor text, because many scholars believe that these creatures were the result of Urza's first attempt at mechanized life, perhaps created in his early days at, as an apprentice in Tokasia. And ever since then, people stumble upon the ornithopter as referenced in the Mirrodin flavor text, regardless of the century, plane, or species developing, artificers never fail to invent the Ornithopter. I just love this card. I think it's great. I think it's, um, uh, again, it's a small reminder of a simpler time. Um, you know, it's kind of just a goofy name with a goofy effect and a goofy card. You know, the other zero mana artifacts, Phyrexian Walker, Shield Sphere, Memnite, don't have this sort of, you know, levity to them. Um, they they, they the aren't. History. They don't have the nostalgia. Yeah, yeah, and they aren't nearly as fun either. I think that Ornithopter just has something inherently, you know, fun and interesting about it. Um, and so I think that that's a, that's that's a delightful card. It's got a lot of clout and a lot of history, and and I think it's great. I think it's just one of those cards that, you know, not only is there the nostalgia factor, but there are a lot of cards from back in the day that we don't talk about anymore, that we don't see anymore. And I think if you would have placed your bets back in, you know, 1999 or whatever, you know, what is the card that's going to be a format defining all star? You know, right. I doubt anybody would have said Ornithopter. And so yep. I think there's nostalgia there, but there's also just sort of the, you know, when you see somebody like when you first start playing modern and you see somebody drop an Ornithopter, there's that feeling of, aww, yeah. like, you like right. and then all of a sudden you see things like steel overseer and art von ravager which we might, we might talk about later and suddenly that o2 is very relevant threat right 
<laughs> or in Cheerios. Yeah. Obviously, the uh, the the oft maligned and rarely played Legacy Deck Cheerios, which is of course named after Modern? the, the yeah. Uh, yeah, which is named after the casting costs of the various creatures in that deck, all of them being zeros. Um, and then you kill your opponent with like Beastmaster's Ascension or something. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Ornithopter, one of one of my favorites. One of the, I mean, I think it's one of everybody's first uh, uh, memories of Magic is Ornithopter. Oh, yeah. I mean, certainly having zero costs way back in the day, it was like, oh, my God, that thing's free. Yep. What are you supposed to do with it? Like, that was kind of where we were at back then. There weren't a lot of great enchantments. There was certainly no equipment. And it was like, this thing's kind of dinky. Yeah. I like it. It's currently currently in standard right now. It was yeah. reprinted uh, as an uncommon in Ether Revolt because you can't have this thing in common in standard. Oh. Woo! Cats and dogs, y'all. Cats and dogs. Imagine, imagine putting Curious Obsession on this. Oh, <laughs> so good. I'm telling you, that card's insane. I love that card. That card's insane. Well, my next card here, uh, that actually I get to have one, which is nice for number eight. I'm not going to have one for number seven. Spoiler alert. Um, right. But I get to talk about a card that, in its day, back in the day, was nuts. Was like the, the, the big, bad like uber creature like it defined standard it helped f shape a format it was so bad that they later made a card whose flavor text talked about how broken this card was yep masticor is insane masticor oh. is a rare from urza's destiny and at the time nothing was close to this card <laughs> Like actual zero. Yep. It's a four generic mana, four, four artifact creature. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you may choose and discard a card from your hand. And if you don't, you sacrifice it. However, it has two abilities, two generic mana colon. Masticore deals one damage to target creature or two generic mana colon. Regenerate Masticore. So it could kill everything they played or, and it was really super tough to kill. It was a four mana for four power and four toughness, which just, again, was not seen back in the day. Yep. Everything warped itself around Masticore and surviving Masticore and playing Masticore. And later on the spell uh, Deep Analysis and Torment, yep. uh, they uh, they had a... Uh, I'm, I'm pulling it up here so I can get it correct. Um, I believe it's the specimen appears to be broken. Yes. This, <laughs> the specimen appears to be broken. Is exactly I didn't know right. it was about that card. Well, it's yep. got a Masticore head on it. That's the head yeah. that they're like, oh. all the mouth that they're looking at. That's a Masticore. So like... Yep. It's a four busted. rows of teeth. Yeah, yeah, and it's terrific because of how insanely good it was back in the day. And we've seen Masticore, a Masticore or two since then. There was one from yeah. New Phyrexia block, wasn't there? The yeah, there's Razor. a yeah. Molten Tail. There's Razor Mane Masticore, and there's also Molten Tail. Masticore. Okay, yeah, yeah, because I like that it's a creature type. Yeah, I like the fact that we do have Masticores as the creature types, and we are able to kind of bring them back. You know, like Masticore showed up in uh, in Vintage Masters, um, which was a thing online, and it showed up in From the Vault Relics, which is cool too. And again, it's one of those. It's like you know, it's day and the sun is past, but yeah, it's I mean, part it's of the definitely been. Magic. It's definitely been outclassed, but you're definitely right. At the time, uh, during Urza's block, the, the heyday of broken artifacts, Masticore was a centerpiece in a lot of the, the tournament-winning decks. Um, again, there it was a massive force on the Pro Tour. Um, it was, uh, 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 I think I believe, a Masticore deck won Worlds that year. Um, and again, for me personally, had it going back to the Sleepers uh, uh, episode, this was one of the cards that uh, began my collect as many as I could before the price jumps cards. Uh, I picked up a bunch of Masticores, like 50 Masticores. A 12 or 13 year old Ruben picked up like 50 Masticores at three bucks a piece and then later sold them all for 15 or 20. Wow. Uh, that, along with Powder Keg, really funded my <clears throat> early magic development. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I have a great love for Masticore, especially this initial Paulo Parente art. I, they changed the art. Uh, and I'm usually a Steve Belladin fan, but like the 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 bronzing sculpture Masticore is just uh, it's just everything. That's awesome, Aaron. What's your number eight? My number eight is creepy as hell. <laughs> it's a very creepy looking card, but this is a card that there are some cards that are good by themselves, like, you know, Sundering Titan, you don't really need to pair it with anything. It does a lot by itself. You know, Reaper King kind of does things, you know, it needs other scarecrows, but there are just some cards that are powerhouses on their own. And then there are cards that are begging you to pair something with it. And you can pair whatever you're into. You can use, uh, you can use Blasphemous Act, you can use Pestilence, it's whatever you feel like. It'll work with anything. Uh, my number eight is Stuffy Doll. 
Um, so Stuffy Doll is five colorless. It's an artifact creature, another construct, uh, zero one. Uh, as Stuffy Doll enters the battlefield, choose a player. Uh, Stuffy Doll is indestructible. Uh, whenever Stuffy Doll is dealt damage, it deals that much damage to the chosen player. And then you can tap it to deal one damage to itself. So it kind of has this voodoo doll type effect to it. Um, but this was reprinted in Magic 2015. And uh, there were a lot of things in the format that you could have paired it with. Blasphemous Act was one of them, Into the Maw of Hell. Uh, there was Revenge of the Hunted, where you could give it like 6-6 six, six and lore, because why not? And sure. um, there were a number of spells like Harvest Pyre. You know, there were some spells in that format, in that standard format, that could target creatures but couldn't necessarily target players. And when you have Stuffy Doll around, that's a really neat way to kind of get around that. It's also a good blocker. Uh, we were in a format where Thrag Tusk was everywhere, and so just being able to whoop. <laughs> yeah. um, I love the newer art. I know a lot of people are torn between the old art and the new art, but this was just a really creepy card. And if you look at the on Gather, they have the sort of discussion, uh, the, the discussion thread. It's neat seeing all the things people would pair with it some guy was like i want to put pariah on it which is neat yeah. and so whatever way you want to get the job done you can do it and it really says something about you as a player um but like i said it really i think what makes stuffy doll shine is what you choose to combine it with for the for the maximum effect well, well stuffy doll is really cool uh because stuffy as a character has actually been on a ton of cards this yep. card he's been back around since alpha this guy really? was sticking around yeah. on black yep. vice cursed rack the Shrek's oh, right, yeah, the yeah. rack. This is the card. Stuffy okay. is the guy who's getting this torn guy. apart and ripped. And, <laughs> this you know. is a character, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. It's it's just the nickname <laughs> given to the doll, yep. represented in the art, and it's really cool that Time Spiral was able to kind of bring it back as this really yeah. interesting, cool, fun card. Well, it's also interesting really, that they gave it indestructible, considering yeah. everything he's been through. Like, right. he's been ripped, he's pulled, he's, and he's still there. Exactly. So he's, he's undamageable. He's, uh, yeah. And, and the new art is also spectacular. I love the... Uh, it's super the, the evocative feeling of the new Stuffy Doll art as well. The combo that I remember with this one was a was a common from Scourge called Guilty Conscience, um, which is a one white mana common aura that says whenever enchanted creature deals damage, it deals that much damage to itself. And so you just put this on a Stuffy Doll and it deals infinite damage. Oh. So that was the that was the combo that my buddy built back in the day for his casual stuffy doll guilty conscience deck. Nice. Um but yeah, super evocative, great character, love it. That's terrific. All right, so we're moving to number 7. I don't have one. It's higher up on someone's list. And by the way, Stuffy Doll was my number nine. So okay. me and Aaron, we were we were very close. There you go. Right there, right there. So sweet. And the card's the card's amazing. It's like it's so yeah. cool. The callbacks all the way back to Alpha. It's a great card in and of itself. You know, it's terrific. So moving right to number seven. Ruben, what is your number seven? <clears throat> it takes something. It takes a real something to be restricted in vintage takes a lot to get you get yourself restricted in vintage in fact there are only two creatures ever that have been restricted in vintage and one of them is lodestone golem mm. so lodestone golem is a four mana five three originally from the world wake expansion it's an artifact creature golem non-artifact spells cost one more to cast uh, this is the reason why Shops became the most powerful deck for its entire length of time since it being printed until it was restricted, still and arguably is. still is. Um, they just keep printing toys for you to play with in that deck, and they keep not banning Mishra's workshop. <laughs> they can't do it. They, won't they can't do it. it. <laughs> the card is bananas. I mean, people were playing Juggernaut in Vintage already. Like, I don't know if people remember this, but people were just playing the card Juggernaut, because you could get mind slavered and your opponent would still have to attack with it. Yeah. So right. that was that was why people played Juggernaut. It was like, well, I can get mind slavered, but I can still attack through my opponent controlling my turn. Um, and and Lodestone Golem very quickly was like, oh, that's not that relevant. This is much more relevant. Putting a a sphere of resistance on all of your opponent's crap for the rest mm -hmm. of the game. Uh, didn't really see a ton of play in any of the other formats, honestly. But when you get restricted in Vintage, it is something else. And so that's why I have Lodestone Golem on my list. Yeah. Yeah, what makes this card so scary is that, you know, when, you, when you're playing a format where you can run Black Lotuses and Moxen and Mishra's, and Mishra's Workshop, um, it's very easy to get this card out. You know, in any other format, you would think four is a lot of mana. It's not in Vintage. And so it is not uncommon to have this thing out on turn one. A 5-3 yep. beater that has attacks on your cards is ridiculous. And, you know, we also talk a lot on, on this show about how having an effect on a stick is a really powerful thing. You know, having a Sphere of Resistance is one thing. Having a Thalia with a 2-1 first strike 
and attacks. Yeah. If that's what your deck already wants to be doing, you're off to the races. And so, you know, having this come out a lot faster than it was probably ever meant to, um, and having a drawback, which you don't necessarily care about if you're tapping a land that makes three mana a turn, um, you know, it's just everything that deck wants. And there's still a lot of discussion as to, is this card worthy of being restricted? <laughs> there are still the diehard fans that swear it's fine. Um, yeah. But having been on the receiving end before, it's it's a beater. <laughs> yeah, the ones that swear it's fine just so happen in the Venn diagram across with those who own workshops. I'm not saying everybody owns a workshop <laughs> once Lotus on Golem on, on ban. I'm yeah. saying that most people who want it on ban to have workshops. Yeah. yeah, And that's okay. That's that's fine, too. Their creatures can be broken and they can stop them. So it's also a nice thing to be like, you know, the, how warped is vintage? Like, this yeah. is restricted, but it's cool in every other format and no one cares. And it's not even that good in any other format. <laughs> But your weird vintage format, congratulations, you get to ban this weird artifact creature. Yep. Yeah. Which is sweet. Aaron. When we found out that we were going to Theros, a, a plane uh, that had uh, Greek influences, it, it was very interesting to see. We were interested to see what they were going to to take from mythology. You know, where are we going to have, you know, a god of war? Where are we going to see lightning bolts? Where are we going to see, you know, an Achilles type character or satyrs or things like that? And so it was really interesting to see what they chose to add to the set. And my number seven is the card that just, just embodies the set for me. And if you were going to do anything Greek related, Related, you had to have this card. Um, and number seven is a Crowan Horse. Um, so a Crowan Horse is uh, an artifact creature horse. It costs four, four colorless mana. It's an 0-4 with Defender. When a Crowan Horse enters the battlefield, an opponent gains control of it. At the beginning of your upkeep, each opponent gets a 1-1 white soldier creature token onto the battlefield. This is a shout-out to the Trojan Horse, uh, which is an actual thing in Greek mythology. Um, and the tale goes that uh, during the Trojan War, um, the Greeks had constructed this huge wooden horse and hit a bunch of dudes inside. Um, their war hadn't been going well. The Greeks pretended to sail away. Um, they leave the horse at the Trojan's doorstep. The Trojans are like, sweet, thanks. They left this thing in. And then at night, the soldiers came out and ended up taking over the city and, and thus ended the war. And so it's really great that they were able to incorporate this. Um, I believe this is what they call a top-down design. Mm -hmm. um, and I just love this. I love the idea of how they incorporate it. Okay, here you go. Here's your horse. And at first glance, you're like, sweet. And then it just basically turns into an assemble the Legion. And if you don't deal with this, um, each opponent, mind you. So in Commander, everybody gets one but you. Um, and this can get out of hand. And I just love the flavor of this. It just, it just drips of flavor and just nothing screams Theros more than this card to me. Yeah, they had a whole, like, you know, the mythology of, you know, the Greeks and, uh, and the Romans and the idea of, you know, essentially everything Trojan is now a Crowan because, yeah. you know, copyrights. Um, <laughs> but, you know, because they can copyright this and a Crowan horse as a send up was was beautiful. Like, it was super yes. cool. It's one of those, like, you get it and you read it and you're like, oh, my God, it's just like Chain to the Rocks. Very similar. Mm -hmm. You're just like, yep. there are some unbelievably thematic <laughs> cards from Theros and this is a terrific option. So, Absolutely. I don't have a number seven, as I mentioned, but we're going to move here to number six. And my number six uh, was one of the first cards after Balduvian Horde, um, where Ooh. I got super excited, where I got to feel the love of spoiler season, where I got to hear someone like be like, there's this crazy card coming up, and you're not going to believe what it does. And as a teenager in the 90s, nothing got you more excited than them going, you know, they're going to... They're gonna make a gonna make a one mana twelve twelve. It's gonna blow your <laughs> mind. And I'm like, what? Yep. A little peek him out, basement flood is crazy. Phyrexian Dreadnought yep. from Mirage is a super cool card. Oh it, gee. It is awesome. It is a one generic mana twelve twelve. That's right. That has trample. A one mana twelve twelve trampler. That's what they ran out back in ninety six. You're just like, <laughs> what's gonna happen? Oh my god, you know, butter my biscuits. Uh, when Phyrexian Dreadnought comes into play, <laughs> sacrifice any number of creatures with total power of 12 or more or bury Phyrexian Dreadnought. Now, for uh, I think a while, I'm not sure it's really played that much anymore, but Illusionary Mask, Phyrexian Dreadnought Stifle used to be able to stifle yeah. knots a thing, which is cool. You, you know, you play it, trigger yeah. goes on the, on the stack, and you stifle it, and you have a 1 mana 12 12, technically a 2 mana 12 12. Right. But that's okay. And so, so that this in and of itself back in the day kind of landed with a thud because you're like, Oh, cause this was one of the real first kind of bait switch. You know, they're like, there's a one man, 12, 12 trampler. Right. You know? And you're like, Oh God, that's what it ended up being. Now later, yeah. plenty of tools to break it. But when it first showed up in the day, it was like, okay, we get it. You're clever. Right. You can't play this in standard. 
The art, though. I remember playing Magic back in the day as a teenager myself and just being being amazed by that art. Again, just that Phyrexian kind of grotesque style of art that, again, we really don't see very much anymore. And Lord knows we might if we, you know, go back to Phyrexia in some way, shape, or form. But it's just very uniquely Phyrexian. You know you won't see that sort of style with, with any other race or, or plane. Oh, man. it's just, I mean, Phyrexian in and of itself is so sweet. I'm so happy we're going to go back and yeah. Phyrexian cards again. It's going to be awesome. Just yes. the flesh and the metal and the craziness and the, the bad guy is awesome. This card was so popular that, that it was a judge foil at one point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, Stifle Knot was highly played in Legacy for a very long time. I remember that I used to sideboard into a Stifle Knot strategy out of my Merfolk deck. Very young Ruben back when I played Merfolk in Legacy. Um, you know, they would have lots of uh, ways to deal with my smaller things, things like lightning bolts. But boy, they can't really deal with a Phyrexian Dreadnought now, can they? I remember um, the first time I faced the Stifle Knot deck, I was so shaken that I got a game warning for drawing from a Grizzle brand I didn't even have. Like, we were playing a Legacy game, and like that happened, and like my Grizzle brand had died somehow, and I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna pay seven life and draw seven cards. And my opponent was a really sweet guy. He was like, "You don't have a Grizzle Brand," and I was like, "Uh, uh, uh the judge." <laughs> Stop. And the judge comes over and he's like, "What's going I'm on?" So I was flustered. Like, I, I was like, "I just got a one mana twelve twelve, and I was so stunned that I drew from a Grizzle Brand I didn't even have." And he was like. Okay. <laughs> and just, I was, it wasn't even a tilt. It was just like that happened. <laughs> Card's real. Card's fantastic. So we're gonna move on here to uh, to Ruben's number six. Ruben, what you got? Uh, so two weeks ago, y'all had Birthing Pod in your top uh, ten favorite artifacts that aren't creatures, and I felt alone. And then I didn't have that. I didn't have that uh, experience with y'all. So I decided to put a creature that has colors in its casting cost that is also an artifact creature. Uh, it's one of the most powerful cards in Legacy. It's one of the most popular cards in Legacy ever since its initial printing, um, which it's now been printed, I think, seven times, if I'm looking at this correctly, between online and life. Um, it first appeared in a pack in it, uh, uh, Eternal Masters. Um and it's it's just a delightful card that does everything I want a card to do. My number six is Baleful Strix. Mm -mm. Mm. It's it's a Baleful Six is my number six Strix. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, it usually does show up in Plain Chase 2012. Oh well, sure. The first time it appeared in a pack was in Eternal. Card is dumb. <laughs> um, it is a blue and a black for an artifact creature bird. It has flying and death touch as a one one, and Why? when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card. Yeah, that card is something else. Uh, this card might single-handedly be uh, the reason why Tarmogoyf appearances got cut in half before Fatal Push even got printed. Uh, because people started playing Baleful Strixes, and this card matches up real well against Tarmogoyf. It just um, does so much. I, I know, it does so much for so little. It's blue, so you can remove it to Force of Will. It costs two and replaces itself. It has evas evasion, so you can carry equipment real well. What more could you possibly ask for? I've blocked Emrakuls with this before. That's one of the best feelings you can have, is when somebody sneaks out an Emrakul, you sacrifice your six permanents, and trade with their 15-15s. Um, <laughs> you little so birds that's, still got that. Yeah, that's that's a fun experience. Um, I just think that Baleful Strix, it's so, it's so good like on every level. And the art by Nils Ham, uh, it doesn't hurt either. So uh, I'm a I'm a big fan of Baleful Strix. Card is the bane of my existence. As somebody who likes to cheat in fatties, you know, there's nothing worse than going through all the trouble of getting a turn one Grizzle brand and then seeing a turn two Baleful Strix and being yeah. like, well, hell. And um, it's just a, so much. And I know Cube, Abel, Cube, Cube April recently did one of her polls as to cards you would like to see in modern and Baleful Strix came up. And there were a number of people that were adamant that modern can never have this card. And, you know, people who really didn't have a lot of experience they were like it's just a bird like what's the big deal it's like no yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> it shuts down it shuts down a lot of angles of attack i remember when uh, fathom feeder came out in battle for zendikar block you know there were the shaheen saranis that were like is this the baleful strix 2.0 and it ended up not being the case but yeah this, there's just nothing like this card and there probably won't be because it's so good for so little investment there's something about strixes there yes. are three Strixes in Magic. There is Tide Hollow. There's Baleful. Ruben, what's the other one? You know the other one? Parasitic Strix. That's right. right. 
It's the wind condition in Aluren these days. Oh, yeah. So they are all birds. They are all like, you know, mechanical artifact, creature artifact birds, creatures. Yeah. They all do really cool things. Tide Hollow, you know, exchanges drawing a card for an extra power. And I, I'm happy with that trade the other way because it's, you know, it still has Death Touch and you're drawing a card yeah. and it's an amazing blocker and that's great. There was a there was a Strix in the original Clash of the Titans from the 60s. It's like Ooh. a mechanical owl, right? Yeah. Is, yeah. is basically the definition of Strix. Also, shout out to Holly Conrad, who plays the character Strix on Dice Camera Action, the streamed Dungeons & Dragons show. Nice. Well, Baleful Strix in and of itself is an unbelievably powerful card. When it first showed up, like before they reprinted it like 12 times, this card used to be very expensive. Yeah. Uh, because it was just hard to get. You know, you had to be, oh, like a plane chase set. All right, okay, they played, put it in Commander. All right. And then they didn't put it out again until Eternal Masters. So, like, over time, we have seen the card even bump up in rarity. It is a rare in Eternal Masters. Right. Know, which is and in every amazing. other set where it was marked as an uncommon, it wasn't in a pack. So that rarity is kind of meaningless. Right. The rarity kind of is what it is. Though, if they could make it common and I could play this in Popper, I would be super happy. I'll tell you what. You can play it as your general in Peasant Commander if you want. <laughs> wow. Okay. Aaron, what's your number six? My number six is higher on somebody else's list. It's the only higher and the only – I don't have any sames tonight, so that's all I've got. Fair enough. All right. So we're going to move on here to number five. Now, mm-hmm. my number five comes from an artifact block, one of the biggest artifact blocks ever. And every time we have an artifact block, something weird happens. Things break. It's adorable. It really is. We've been here three <laughs> times with Urza's and Mirrodin and Kaladesh. It's like, guys, you know you're going to break it. All these, I, I'm going to get it. But they are, are always very exciting. And this card isn't necessarily busted or broken or whatever. This card was very iconic. This card uh, was very much representative of the set. This card also had a simple line of text that had never been seen until it showed up. Uh, it was was beautiful it was flying it was in mirrodin and it was platinum angel because mm. platinum angel is a seven generic mana four four rare artifact creature angel from mirrodin that has flying and has one beautiful sentence that says you can't lose the game and your opponents can't win the game now this was like back in the day i mean this was this was in the same set as mind slaver and like no one knew what to do with themselves in terms of like uh uh, what do you, what do you mean? I can't, I can't win. What does that mean? What, is I can't win. I can't. And you're like, no, you can't win. And you're like, well, what if you're like negative 37? It's like, it, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm still alive. You're like, um, I don't get it. And you're like, I don't know what to tell you. It was state based effects and stuff, but like this creature is going to be here. It's going to represent the set. It was on a ton of promotional stuff. Uh, it, it has been reprinted a lot. Um, but even being reprinted so many times, we're talking like what, eight times here between sure. conspiracy and from the vault angels, magic 2010 and 2011. It's still almost like a $4 card. And that doesn't sound like a whole bunch of money, but again, think of how many times this thing has been reprinted and how often it's going to show up in EDH deck. Cause you can put it in any of them. Shout out to Victor Minguez for doing the most recent version, the the masterpiece version, where she's got oh, the very yeah. Beyonce curvilicious mm. feature figure with like the cloak of like the wings made out of the sheets. Mm. That that version is just gorgeous, and this is still this is a staple of the mono blue Tron decks and modern. Um, you know, you buy yourself some time with this, and then you mind slaver lock them, and it's just it's just a really uh, crucial card. I know this was something that people were. I know there was some talk of ad nauseum, uh, modern and nauseum. In fact, was always our worst matchup, and there was some. Spicy brewers out there that were running Madcap Experiment into Platinum Angel, um, so awesome. that way they couldn't kill you. Um, um, that is that just, really great. Actually. Yeah, it was really, really fringe, and it didn't really take off. But it was something I saw Devin Kepke try once, and I was like, I should get around to that. I never did, but yeah, card is great. Yeah, I nice. definitely enjoy the bootylicious version. Yeah, um, <laughs> as it were. Yeah. yeah. The uh, the um, yeah, Platinum Angel is delightful. Obviously, has also seen some play in in very very old vintage. Um, there was a Blue Angels deck, I believe, championed by Owen Turtenwald, uh, mm-hmm. that used this and Pact of Negation, and then you didn't have to pay for your Pact because you wouldn't lose the game. Um, saw some fr- fringe Pro Tour play. May have won a Pro Tour actually. I'm not sure. I, I'm not up on my history on that one, but uh, has seen a lot of printings. I wouldn't be shocked to have have it see a top eight appearance or two. Um, just a super iconic card. Never before have you seen that line of text and for that alone it's iconic it was terrific uh ruben what's your number five my number five is a more recent card uh, a more recent memory as you said whenever they do an artifact block something interesting and new comes along something gets broken and something uh this one isn't from the energy 
uh, uh, debacle. Uh, don't worry about that too much. But this did see play in all formats, standard, modern, legacy, and vintage. It even replaced one of the most popular shops cards, um, uh, Triskelion. Uh, as as one of the win conditions Ooh. in vintage shops. Most recently, it won a Pro Tour in the hands of Seth the Manimal Manfield it's in, in his Sultai Energy deck, uh, and it's Walking Ballista. So Walking Ballista is a 0-0 artifact creature construct from Aether Revolt. Walking Ballista enters the battlefield with X, plus one, plus one counters on it. Pay four mana, put a plus one, plus one counter on Walking Ballista. Remove a plus one, plus one counter from Walking Ballista. It deals one damage to target creature or player. Um, in Vintage, obviously, with all that fast mana, you can play this as like a 6-6 six, six very quickly. Even just a 3-3 three, three for six mana, which would replace the uh, Triskelion. In standard, particularly with things like Winding Constrictor, Constrictor, which allows you to bump up the number of counters... It sees play in decks like Free Win Red in Modern um, as, a, as a win condition and a way to clear off the board. Uh, just a very popular, very good card at being a you know creature that can attack and block, but also ping off annoying other stuff that's flying through the skies or is unblockable or something along those lines. Walking Ballista, just a very powerful card uh, and, and has the Pro Tour pedigree. Only doesn't have a masterpiece because it was printed too soon, I think, uh, as we have a hanger back walker masterpiece, but no walking ballista masterpiece. Um, just an excellent card, and I think well deserving of this spot on the list. It's also an Eldrazi Tron in modern. This is a oh, yeah. staple of those decks. And yeah, this card shot straight to vintage. You know, it didn't see a lot of modern play at the time. Legacy really wasn't touching it. It was seeing a little bit of play in standard, but I will never forget the vintage challenge that it just soared right to the top. And Randy Bueller was like, I called it. Like the card is nuts and it says something about a card when it can skip every other format and go straight to vintage and stay there when it can bump out existing staples like Triskelion that have been there for a really long time and you know this card just changes games go back and watch the finals match between like Rich Shea at, at the last eternal weekend and just the, the the things this card did the way that it changed combat the way that it pulls wins out of nowhere um the card is just absurd and you can sacrifice it to you know to exile bridge from belows if you're right. playing against a dredge deck and so the card is just great in the early game great in the late game it's just a gross card Hangerback Walker was like, I am so good in every format. <laughs> and, it like, and, and it was. And it was. Still and then Walking still. Ballista was like, hold my beer because <laughs> I got to go in there and show them how it's done. Right. Hold my WD-40. I'll be right wow. back. Wow. Hold, hold the oil, as it were. <laughs> the card itself, however, is fantastic. It was great. More or less from the outset, but it did take a minute. It took a minute. But once that minute was up, everybody and their mom yep. was like, this card's bananas. They figured it out. And it's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and it's super powerful. Uh, Aaron, what is your number five? So now we're going to get into the most absurd of the absurd. The cards were like, you just can't help but ask yourself why. <laughs> um, so part of playing a reanimator deck is is choosing the right tools for the job. You know, a lot of people think that we just want to slam a Grizzle Brand on turn one. And there are some games where Grizzle Daddy is all that you need. But occasionally you might run into a Caracas or you might be vulnerable to Liliana of the Veil. And so you might want things like Grave Titan uh, as, insurance, as again, insurance against Liliana. Or you might want sometimes just even reanimating a Chancellor of the Annex. If you're facing a storm deck, you know, you have to sort of choose the right tool for the job. And my number five is a really great tool, specifically against the death and taxes deck, specifically against decks where they're going to have targeted removal for what you're trying to do. Or if you're just, you just happen to be in a format full of blue decks. Um, my number five is Inkwell Leviathan. <laughs> Inkwell Leviathan is seven colorless and two blue mana because, of course, it is. Um, it's an artifact creature, Leviathan, seven eleven, seven Always power open. and eleven toughness. Nice. It's just nuts. Um, Island Walk and Trample. <laughs> and if sure. that's not enough for you, it also has Shroud. Um, and fun fact, Shroud does not affect reanimation spells. Um, I know when I first saw this card, I was like, I can't target it with reanimate. Yes, you can. Go have fun. Um, but yeah, this card is gross. And so if you're worried about death and taxes, you know, obviously they're going to Caracas your Iona, Caracas your Elishnorn. That's a bad scene. So just slamming a turn one Leviathan. There goes your swords to plowshares. There goes whatever. This is still a really good time. Um, the card is just gross. And if you're any, if you're a reanimator deck, you don't leave home without this card because the matchups it's good in. It's great. And, and you just look at it. The art is very, you're not even really sure kind of what you're looking at. You just see this big monstrosity kind of coming from the waves. Yeah. Um, and this is also something the Mono Blue decks, Mono Blue Tron likes to run as sort of their fatty du jour. Um, and the card is just absurd. It's always the card people have to read. And you're like, oh, it's just a 7-Eleven Shroud Island Lock Trample. Is that all? <laughs> 
<laughs> and the card is just dumb. I love it. Yeah. It's so big. Like it's just it's just <laughs> yeah. monstrous. It's massive. Like it's this weird like thing. And then there's a little lighthouse right there, a little tiny itty bitty <laughs> next to this monster that just runs over you. And seven eleven with the power of toughness is amazing. <laughs> is there it anything is totally else? Totally arbitrary. I don't know why it has seven power and eleven toughness. <laughs> I don't know why it has 11 toughness is the real answer is the real question here like yeah. that doesn't make any gosh darn sense um but yeah it's it, it it's good for the memes good for always being open 24 24 7 7 11 there's been exactly three cards with 7 with 11 seven and 11 does toughness. anyone know what the other two are no one was uh, made no. i'll give you a hint one was made okay. in rise of the eldrazi Oh, Pathraiser of Ulamog. Nope. No, not Pathraiser. The uh, Spawn Sire of Ulamog. That's correct. Spawn Sire of Ulamog okay. was our first 7 Eleven. The second one was newer. The second one was an Ether Revolt. Oh, is it the stupid vehicle? It's the stupid vehicle. <laughs> one, <laughs> Can mana you that down? one mana One mana 7 Eleven, Crew 6 on the Consulate yeah. Dreadnought. Oh. Right. That was right. It was the Dreadnought callback. Yes. Okay. It was. Dreadnought callback, right? Okay. Because, oh, it's a one-mana creature for all these powers and toughnesses, and you still need a million power in play to get it to work. Exactly, which is I, super cute. And, and again, th this is one of those super... It's cool because it's unique. It's cool because there's only been three of them ever. Right. This yeah. is my favorite Tinker target, I think. This is my favorite thing to go get with Tinker, because it's just like, yeah, go ahead, go get that. I'll just Swords to, or Path to Exile, whatever you play. Oh, no. Oh, dear. Oh, God. I died. So... <laughs> We're moving on here to number four, and number four Ooh. I share, which is cool, because I put out a, a Twitter poll, and this was about an hour I'm, or so I'm going to eat a peach ring and let you guys have this. It's about, it's about three hours ago. It's fine. <laughs> and I said, hey, 695 artifact creatures in magic, and me and Ruben picked the exact same number four. Which one was it? Platinum Angel. Clearly, that's not going to happen. Blightsteel Colossus. Worm Coil Engine or Solemn Simulacrum. Now, at first, Worm Coil Engine was in the lead. And mm -hmm. as time has gone by, Solemn Simulacrum currently has 43% of the vote, Worm Coil 38, Platinum 10, and Blight still 9. And the answer certainly is Solemn Simulacrum. My number six. Nice. Go oh, right along right along the same lines of thought. <laughs> because it's just such amazing value. It's it's Jens Thorin's invitational card first of all for those who don't know it actually started out as an invitational card that's supposed hmm. to be somebody's face on the mirror in one yeah i had no idea back in the day i, I, was, <laughs> I, mean, I started playing again after you know about to be in the games in the stronghold so i had no idea who that person was i just yeah. knew this card was ridiculous because again i came from a world where creatures are bad this thing rampant growths when you enter the battlefield and draws you a card when it dies nothing ever is supposed to be that good this is yep. crazy so there was that kind of moment for me but then but later on you know being in the cube playing this thing over and over over the years like it's just consistently awesome it's been yeah. awesome ever since mirrodin showed up it's not like it's not like something has been like oh the new solemn simulacrum no there's right there's one solemn and that's it and that this is the one well, this is one of the rare creatures. This was also my number four, in case the context clues didn't uh, suggest that to you. This is one of the rare reprints where the first printing, it was like, didn't really see a lot of play. Because it came out in Mirrodin, and, you know, everything kind of got swallowed up by the Affinity Menace. Right. So when they reprinted it uh, later on in M12, and it became a, 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 a centerpiece of the 246 mana base of Rampant Growth into Solemn Simulacrum into Primeval Titan... Then it started picking up in more popularity. It became super popular in Wolf Run Ramp. It won Worlds in 2011. Um, it was uh, in four of the decks across three different archetypes at Pro Tour Dark Ascension, including Brian Kibler's winning deck. Um, it's the most played artifact creature in Commander. It's in about a quarter of all Commander decks, according to EDHREC.com. Wow. Um, it's just pure value. It's great in everything, and uh, it's, it's just one of the best cards of all time. It was a birthing pod deck stream because it did something yeah. on the way in and something on the way out, and you can't ask for better than that. And that was that was the deck I believe that Lucas Blohan played at uh, Pro Tour Dark Ascension. Uh, was was had at least a couple copies of these in there um, it, with Kibler and PV obviously playing the the Wolf Run Ramp deck, um, and then another player playing sort of like a green black mid range control thing. Uh, all of which using Solemn Simulacrum, the Sad Robot as it was originally called, yes. that original art. 
Um, and we'll get to the mad robot later. Uh, but the, <laughs> the, the sad robot uh, um, being the, the, the nickname initially, all, all apologies to Jens Thorin for, <laughs> for everyone just thinking he has resting sad face. <laughs> wow. Well, there were two pack releases. There was Mirrodin and Magic 2012. And then it was in Commander 2011. It was Commander 2014, 2015, 2016. It was a Kaladesh invention, which still goes for like 50-something dollars. Yep. And it's still a five-plus dollar card. Yeah. This card is amazing. It's always yeah. good. It's not been outclassed, per se. And I don't really want it to be, because if something's right. outclassed and... You know, Psalms and Lacrim. Whew, yeah. That that, that seems scary. Exactly. <laughs> they could but, make it they could make uh like a five mana three three that does it in reverse or something. They could like five mana three three when it comes into play, draw a card, when it leaves play rampant growth or something like that. Just to be a callback, but I don't want them to ever try to make a better solemn simulacrum. Because why? Why would you need to? It's great. It's got a fantastic stats. Aaron, what's your number four? I tried not to like my number four. Uh, so I like my EDH budget. You know, I don't like to spend a lot of money on EDH. And I remember I found a budget Sharoom list last year, and this was the most expensive card on the list. It was $12. <laughs> She says with a play set of bazaars. Um, and I just didn't want to do it. I was like, that's a lot of money. Like, I don't want to. Like, I'd never played with the card before. I had no experience with it. And the person who built the list was like, don't even leave home without this card. You're going to want this card. And so I slammed the $12 down. I was like, I guess. Like, it's fine. I'm going to hate this. This is terrible. I just, my way of doing things. I just bitched and moaned. And then when I got to use the card, somebody explained to me the ruling behind it. And they were like, Aaron, it, it works a different way. And it opened up a whole other other door for me and I started to, to clue into how broken the card could be and now the card is fantastic um, I, you have not lived until you've looped Spine of Ishtas <laughs> or looped Scouring Glasses or even just looped itself, it's just a fantastic card um, my number 4 is Master Transmuter um, so Master Transmuter is 3 colorless and a blue, it's an artifact creature, human artificier that's a 1-2, one, 1 power, 2 toughness, uh, you can pay a blue and tap it to return an artifact you control to its owner's hand, uh, you may put an artifact card from your hand onto the battlefield so what did this for me is the card you bounce, you can then replay. <laughs> oh my god! Yep. <laughs> I have done dumb things with this card and made people very sad. You can also use it to bounce itself because it's an artifact creature. So if there's a board wipe coming down, uh, or if you are doing broken things and people decide to target it, you can be like, mm, no, and you bounce it back. Right. Um, the card is hilarious. It's the best $12 I've ever spent. I can't believe I ever doubted this card. Um, but if you have any sort of enter the battlefield artifacts, Icar Wellspring does whoop. Whoop! <laughs> um, the card just makes me so happy. My friend Visla uh, recently got a forearm tattoo um, that was partially inspired by this card. Trans, transmuter, hashtag trans mafia. Um, there's all sorts of in-jokes with that. But the card is great, and I just can't believe I ever doubted it. Wow. This card is one of those that... You, you, when I first saw it, I was just like, "You're um so uh, mana costs." You remember when right. you bypass those and bad things happen? Yeah, I was certainly expecting this thing to to do something bad in standard, but I think its stats made it not do so. Right, four mana, one two, got to have something else, got to be able to untap with it, yada yada. There was lots a lot of shatters and you know and things that destroyed artifacts back in the day, but but as a casual card, it's it's basically perfect like they they kind of kept going and they made stoneforge mystic and like oops uh but you know this was sort of that first like hey you don't need mana costs who cares about mana costs just put whatever you want down and so that was really cool in that i'm glad it didn't break standard and it's really fantastic that it kind of went where it's supposed to go this this is the casual player's awesome card the placement of the colon in this our activated ability is super interesting the fact that it's pay a blue comma tap comma return an artifact to its owner's hand colon means that you don't get to re respond to the artifact getting returned it's part of the cost it's That's out right. of there before there's ever a chance mm -hmm. so that makes it s insanely powerful whereas if if the colon was placed after the tap it would merely be quite powerful it would merely be very good as opposed to pretty insane that you can't even respond to the master transmuter leaving the battlefield Right at that point, you'd probably have to have something like you, uh, you know, choose target artifact or choose an artifact you control. Right. If you do return it to your hand or whatever, it, blah blah blah. Right. It would be, uh, it would be different wording. It would be like goblin welder style wording. Right. Yeah. Which would be interesting, but the card itself, again, just all star. Uh, moving on here to number three. Uh, I don't have one because it's higher on someone's list. So, Ruben, what's your number three? Uh, my number three is one of the most sought after artifact creatures in terms of its 
ubiquity across the modern format. It is a card that you constantly see in main decks and sideboards in modern. Um, it appeared in two different uh, Pro Tour winning decks, both of them modern, both of them twin, uh, by Antonio Del Morel Leon at uh, Pro Tour Fate Reforged and Samuel Estrati at the first modern Pro Tour in Philadelphia in 2011. Um, recently, it was a judge promo, I believe. Mm -hmm. with brand new art by Svetlin Velenov. Um, and it's been creeping up in price, and it's been a, a standout. It's a stellar card even to this day in the cube. Um, my number three is Spellskite. Uh, so Spellskite is a two-mana artifact creature horror, meaning that it doesn't get returned to your hand by Thing in the Ice Awoken Horror. Uh, <laughs> it's an 0-4, rare from New Phyrexia originally, and you may pay a blue Phyrexian mana, meaning that you can either pay a blue or two life, to change the target of, spell, of a spell or ability to Spellskite. This makes it a nightmare for Bogles, for Burn... For removal spells targeting uh, that are trying to target Pester Mites or Deceiver Exarchs, but instead are targeting Spellskites. Whatever hate card you have in play, uh, instead of destroying my Graph Digger's Cage, Aaron, you're destroying my Spellskite for the cost of two life. Uh, it's just an insane card. It's super powerful. Oh, by the way, doesn't have Defender despite having no power, so you can hook up swords to this thing if you really uh, are, are in a pinch. Um, just a spectacularly good card, powerful beyond belief, um, and I'm glad that it saw at least one reprint in the form of a Judge card, but probably needs more reprints in the future. It's also a nightmare for the modern Ad Nauseam decks. Uh, we used to run Conflagrate as a really nice way to deal with it, because if you only deal one damage with the Conflagrate, it can't redirect more than one. So like, let's right. say you Conflagrate for five, you go one to Spellskite, two to you, two to you, and that's fine. So that's a really clean way to deal with it. Um, you can win with the Spellskite in play if you want to go the Lightning Storm route, but you basically just have to make them run out of life. So you have to have pretty much all of your lands, and you basically just keep redirecting, and then you make them until they can't anymore, and then you can't kill them um wow. yeah a card is hella pesky um not only is it a good blocker and i remember it being something that the pod decks again or even the the abs index could cord into yeah. um that was something you could do again to just sort of buy yourself some time if you were on the archangel of foon plan throw some counters on it and just attack with your spell skite um yeah. card is gross and i'm not surprised to see that it's still up there because there's always going to be a home for spell skite Vrexia mana is broken now, there yeah. is, there's just no two ways about it. It's busted. And this card is like, this is one of those like design, this is one of those sort of R&D developer masterpieces. This is one of yeah. those cards that is, it can go on anything, you know, like Phyrexia Man is broken, but that means everybody can play it. Uh, it, it it's just a, such a scalpel in the format. It's four toughness doesn't get killed by Bolt. Like, you know, you yep. have to kind of commit to kill this stupid thing. It disrupts a ton of strategies. Like, this is one of those, like, you know, I, I recall uh, Aaron Forsyth and sort of the, his proud papa moment when Spellsky was revealed to the world. He's just like, hey, you guys see this one? Because everything was different once Spell Sky mm -hmm. was out there. There's only been two printings. Uh, there's been New Phyrexia and Modern Masters 2015. It's still a seven, eight dollars eight dollar card. I was honestly expecting a higher one because yeah. I've seen it see so much play in so many different right. decks. Yeah. Uh, this was my number seven was Spell Sky. And because I do definitely think it believes it belongs in the top ten. Uh, yep. we just disagreed on where it was going to go. Sure. There you go. Uh, Aaron, what's your number three? My number three is a commander that has a reputation for doing broken things. If you're playing this commander, you are not here to play fair. And I remember when I first decided I wanted to play with this commander, I decided I was going to try to play fair because I play with a very budget fun, casual group. You know, we really don't do any infinite things. We try to keep it fun. And, and I thought that by instituting a budget cap, I would be able to do that because most of the decks that run this commander go ham. They, they really want to for lack of a better term, pimp this deck out, as the kids say. Um, and I didn't want to do that. I was like, we're going to do a $100 version. We're going to water it down a little bit. And I remember I played Commander with Vorthos Mike, Mike Lineman, and I remember we were getting ready to play, and he goes, so how powerful would you say your deck is on a scale of 1 to 10? And I was like, it's $100, like a 4, it's going to be fine. And then cut to me soul scouring everybody, and he was like, yeah, your deck's not a 4. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I just learned that if you're going to play this Commander, just give it up. Just give in to the brokenness, because you're never going to play fair. She is the leader of Esper, she is Sharoom the Hegemon. Yes! 
queen. Um, I love everything about her. She is three, a white, a blue, and a black. Legendary artifact creature Sphinx. She's a 5-5 five, five with flying, and then when Sharoom the Hegeman enters the battlefield, you may return target artifact card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Pair it with Master Transmutator, and you got yourself a good time. Um, I love her. She's a strong, powerful Sphinx. You don't need no mans. Look at that art. She's giving you curves. She's giving you body. She's giving you mind. I love the lore of this card. Um, she lost her lover. She worked at Tezzeret. Tezzeret and her had a little... Uh, business relationship and then he was like yeah go rule that plane go do your thing and i was like even tezzeret was like do you boo like <laughs> i just love her so much and she's one of the this most the most fun commanders i've ever played with i can't really play her because she's that dangerous but when you right. get into it you just do dumb things <laughs> well according to our friends at merriam webster it is hegemon hegemon okay sure as in hegemony I guess like like, uh, like lording like lording power over something. Okay, wow. Yeah. yeah, I've always wondered how to do that. I always just said Hegeman, but okay. But that's okay because you know the sort of the adage is if you know don't make fun of someone who has mispronounced a word. They learned it by reading. So sure. They, they didn't learn it by someone saying hegemon to you. You were like, oh, hegemon. Right. I have a lot of those. <laughs> I have a lot of those in my uh, in my life. So I can I can appreciate. But that. the card itself, I mean, it is an incredibly powerful monster. Is art. the art is unbelievable. Like Izzy just killed it. And part of the, the allure of Esper was like Sharoom and what she did and how she acted and how she just she just kind of did whatever she wanted because it's Sharoom. So that's her flavor like text always is always great too. Her flavor text is on a couple of cards. Um I seem to remember the time Steve one where she was like, I pray that I'm never considered useless or old. And it's like, oh my god, like she's just so you know, the Sphinx the male Sphinxes seem to really lean on the riddle aspect, and she just sort of leans on like again the time timelessness like i just love yeah. that about her fantastic so uh we're gonna move on here to number two i, I can't believe well I, I can believe that maybe this is higher on either one of y'all's list and maybe it's the same because <laughs> this uh, this card in particular i was like wow you know this might even be higher on somebody else's list this card i mean like the moment i saw it was almost like a love affair with this thing it was ridiculous uh, it was amazing from the moment it showed up it was it was around the time when you know mythics were still kind of new and interesting and different and you know scars mirrodin came out and again the artifact block oh my god crazy yeah. friction oil stuff's going nuts and they made a creature that was so good. I just, I, I, I couldn't. I was just like, I can't stand the value on this thing. I can't stand the idea that Worm Coil Engine gives you so much value. It just doesn't stop. It's amazing. <laughs> this card is ridiculous. <sighs> Worm Coil Engine is a six generic mana mythic rare from Scars of Mirrodin. It is a 6-6 six, six worm. That has death touch and life link. However, why? Oh, we're not even getting. We ain't even start because when it's put into the graveyard, when it dies, oh. you put a three three colorless worm artifact creature token with death touch and a three three colorless worm artifact creature token with life link onto the battlefield. This card is bananas. It was bananas yep. when it first showed up. It's like, why does a six six have death touch? What is it really oh. afraid it's not killing at that point? Right. But, but then it busts. There's a like party. Little... There's a party of six six death touchers. This and Grave Titan, and there's a couple others. It's just like okay, sure, whatever. The you artwork to break up. Why? The artwork is insane. The artwork, like this, is some of the best art in Magic, in my opinion. Like I love this art so much. It's so good. Raymond Swanlin. And it was great because uh, Raymond Swanlin was at Pro Tour Paris, which essentially was like you'd call Pro Tour Scars of Mirrodin. Um, sure. So I got to go and like gush and just be like, oh, it's love work. Yeah, this is incredible. And I don't know what to do, but you're amazing. High five. You know, like, because it's like, you made this and it's beautiful and it's powerful and it stayed powerful. This card was oh, a Kaladesh invention yeah. of like $90. It's still a $20 card, been made two times once Scars of Mirrodin, once Commander 2014. And then, of course, your invention which I don't really think counts as a reprint. Uh, Worm Coil Engine's amazing. That's all Tron I got never leave home without it. Um, mm -hmm. It is usually what the, it's, it's, it's seen as like, it's the card they'll settle for. You know, they want Karn, they want yeah. Ugin, they want Ulamog, but they'll take a Worm Coil. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've been on the receiving end of it, where it's just something you've got to deal with. It gets out of hand so fast. And then even if you do manage to deal with it, you're like, oh, great, I now need to deal with these little three threes. And it's just a yeah. pain. It's just absurd. This is the shout, shout out to Christian Calcano and Anthony Eason, the lifelink and the death touch tokens from back in the day. <laughs> nice. um, this was also the uh, the pre-release promo. Yeah. 
with also art by Raymond Swanland for some reason. They were just like, draw two of them. Have them facing in different directions, <laughs> yeah. but just draw two of them. Have a little fly. fun. But but I remember this from from that pre-release as well. I had a, I had a busted deck at that pre-release. I had a mono blue deck that had I think four blue cards in it, and the rest were artifacts. Um, yeah, that was a fun deck. In any case, Worm Coil Engine was my number ten. Okay. Um, so we finally found found the number ten on my list. Uh, also in the eight clone deck that Brad Nelson made famous at Grand Prix Minneapolis. Um, basically, the whole point of that deck was to make as many Worm Coil engines as you possibly can. And again, obviously, in all of the various versions of Tron, um, anything that's relying on creature combat, anything that's relying on the red zone, Worm Coil engine is going to dominate. And that's that's basically the, the meta games in which uh, things like Jund are popular. Worm Coil Engine's where you want to be at. Um, it's just a, a supremely powerful card. And going back to the six sixes with Death Touch, Evan, as you like to spring quizzes upon me, mm. there are five six six creatures in de- with Death Touch in Magic history. One of them's Worm Coil Engine. One of them is Grave Titan, as I, I mentioned. I know one. Yeah, go on. Soul of Innistrad. The Soul of Innistrad, correct. M fifteen is a six six creature with Death Touch. Uh, and the other two are newer than that. Hmm. One of them, one of them is Tetsi Mulk, the Primal Death. Oh, <laughs> believe it yes. or not, <laughs> has Death Touch in addition to the Prey Counters. Um, and one of my favorite German translations of all time is Worm Spiral Machine for Worm Coil Engine. Oh. It's a really good one. But another one I really appreciate is Das Gitrog Monster, um, wow. which is the. The other six six with death touch that's amazing worm coil engine is just the perfect card that like if i had a time machine and i could go back and show my 15 year old self like hey this is what creatures are like in the future and i'd be like you're not really from the future this is made up right. bs get out of my face you're a liar yeah you're yeah. a liar this is crazy they would never do this in a million years that's insane and this is the type of card that it is and yet here we are. ruben what's your number two my number two is um <sighs> It's tough for me to argue that this isn't the most powerful for its time artifact on the list. At Pro Tour New, or- Pro Tour New Orleans in 2003, there were 16 copies in the top eight. Uh, John Finkel won worlds in spectacular fashion with this card. To this day, it's only ever been printed in a pack during Urza's Destiny. That's the only time that you could get this card in a pack. They're still like 35 bucks a piece. This was the first foil I ever opened out of an Urza's Destiny pack, and I sold it for like 20 bucks. I was very proud of myself. Now they're worth about 800. Um, my number two is Metalworker. Oh. I mean, I it, it, I understand that Mastercore got all the publicity back in the day, but Metalworker is where it's at, folks. Three colorless mana. For a 1-2, it's been errated to be a construct, by the way. Tap, okay. reveal, a- tap, colon, reveal any number of artifact cards in your hand, and you may add two colorless to your mana pool for each card revealed in this way. Back in the day, this was pumping out, obviously, Mastercores, but also uh, Thran Dynamos to save some of that mana for later. But more realistically, Voltaic Keys and Phyrexian Colossuses and Phyrexian um, Processors to be able to actually, factually kill your opponent. There is a different art available that was in a Magic Online expansion, um, but it kind of looks like somebody made it with with Minecraft. Um, I really (laughs) like the original Don Hazeltine sort of cartoony Baron's Codex art um, that I don't really know what's going on in. I would anticipate if they ever reprinted this card, it would get another art um, just because this isn't the style of art that they go with anymore in Magic. But Metal Worker, near and dear to my heart, has always been a card that I love. Um, it's it's just a spectacularly powerful thing. It can pump out, you know, you can get to this th- ridiculous amounts of mana on turn two or turn three when you have this card uh, on turn one or turn two. Um, it's still to this day a part of the mud decks in Legacy. Just a great card, and I love it. My friend Kate plays Mud and Legacy, and she vows she swore to get a metal worker tattoo because she loves the card. I remember when they announced it at the last Eternal Weekend in Europe, they had the metal worker play that and the Life from the Loam play that. And I was freaking out over the Loam, and she was like, get me that metal worker. And then Star yeah. City Games offered it for a limited time. And yeah, card is that's definitely a card that you need to deal with. Like the minute it hits the board, thank God, it has summoning sickness because it's like. <laughs> well, you're not going to see it ever reprinted because it's on the reserve list. Oh, it's on the reserve list. list. Oh, my. Yeah. Oh no. And that oh, ship dear. has 
That ship has long sailed, so if you Yikes. want your copies, they are thirty-three dollars and only rising, as it yeah. as of this uh, as of this recording. Aaron, mm, that's not great. What is your number two? I have been on the receiving end of this card far too many times, and you can tell that when they made it, they tried to make it so that you couldn't cheat it into play. Um, a lot of times with fatties, you will see what I call the shuffle clause, where it's like if this card hits the graveyard, you have to shuffle it into your, in your grave into your library, which means you can't really I left reanimate it. Out for shuffle clause. <laughs> <laughs> To, that was good. I'm not, that was good. I'm not mad. It brings you, you can, uh, top decks all Christmas long, <laughs> as it were. But you can tell that they try. They try to do their due diligence and was like, you know what? We don't want you guys cheating this thing into play. We just don't want you to do it. And cut to vintage and cut to an innocuous little card called Tinker, um, which kind of got around that, where people were like, all right, if I can't reanimate it, I'm just going to play it from my hand, and everything's mm-hmm. going to be great. Um, this is the epitome of why... <laughs> My number two is Blightsteel Colossus. Um, So Blightsteel Colossus costs 12 mana. Okay. Um, Artifact creature Golem, uh, 11-11. Why? (laughs) Trample, Infect, and if that's not enough, if if you're like, I'm not getting enough for 12 mana, it's also indestructible. (laughs) Um, And then if it would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, reveal Blightsteel Colossus and shuffle it into its owner's library and said, Tinker might as well just say, go get a Blightsteel Colossus and win the game. Um, This is scary. Um, You need to deal with it right now, right now. And it's cute if you got blockers because you only need 10 infect to die. (laughs) So if you're chomping with your little one ones, that ain't going to work. And even whatever little creatures you have, this is going to add up very quickly. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had to quick just sacrifice things to Cabal Therapy because mama needs blockers. <laughs> oh um, and the card is just gross. The art is very cool as well. It kind of reminds me of the Iron Giant kind of gone yep. bad. Um, but this is just the epitome of why. <laughs> yeah. This was. I, this I was, very. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, this was uh, this was my number three. Uh, yeah. Because good old one shot the robot. Uh, one shot robot. Yeah. As, there's, as it's been called. This is the callback to Dark Steel Colossus. Uh, which is the actual Iron Giant. Right. Yeah. Which is the actual Iron Giant. Looks amazing. And, th- and that one back in the day was an 11 mana, 11, 11 trampler, indestructible. If it would be put in the graveyard, you shuffle it. That's cool. Then they added a mana and they gave it. In fact, it's as if Dark Steel Colossus was a 20, 20, like a 21, 21. And it was like, yeah. all right, good luck with this. See you later. Because you couldn't one shot with Dark Steel Colossus. You can just one shot with Blight Steel. Yep. Yeah, I mean, there's a there are a lot of colossi across uh, across all of Magic. I've referenced the Phyrexian variety and the Colossus of Sardia earlier. Earlier, when you were talking about the Acroan horse, I thought you were going to talk about the Colossus of Akros. Um, but yeah, Darksteel Colossus was the one that very nearly made my list because I thought that we were going to talk about Blightsteel Colossus on someone's list, and we would have. Um, but then I realized that we would just talk about it here. Um, but people used to tinker for Darksteel Colossus back in the day and tooth and nail for Darksteel Colossus back in the day because it was a two shot robot well you know what's even better than that is just killing your opponent with one <laughs> swing and that's what blightsteel colossus does i have blocked many a blightsteel colossus with a two toughness creature oh yeah to just survive yep uh yeah the card's really good wow so uh we're gonna move on here to number one to numero uno now this number one is also shared between myself and rube so i talked a little yeah. bit about psalm simulacrum ruben tell us about our number one Look, I can say that Metal Worker is the most powerful for its time. It's not the most powerful of all time. There is a card that has dominated more formats. Uh, if, if there is a card that has dominated more formats, I certainly can't think of it. And if there's a, an artifact creature that's dominated more formats, it's Metal Worker or Bust. That, those are the only two options. And I think that this one takes the cake. It's the only artifact creature that's ever been bl- uh, banned in a block format. Um, it is, uh, it, it was obviously a pro tour winner in the hands of Pierre Canali It pro tour Columbus in 2004. Um, there had, there were two copies, uh, two decks that had four copies of this in the top eight of pro tour Kobe in the hands of Yelger Vigersma and Ben Stark. Um, it's, it's the most powerful version of shops in vintage everyone, uh, most of the time it is the, uh, the centerpiece of the affinity deck in modern extended and every oh, format no. that it's ever been in. It is the mad robot. It's Arcbound Ravager. It's such a beast. They literally added beast as its yep. creature type. It is a creature type beast. <sighs> and there's That's this right. incredible, incredible story 
that R&D had no idea what they were making. They had zero. They said apparently I, as the set was coming out, somebody in the office was like, oh, I was thinking about building an Affinity deck with Arcbound Ravager in it. Mm-hmm. I think Samstad said it was supposed to it was supposed to cost three, and at the last minute they took it down to two. And oh, another last minute uh, yep. change from oh, that block and Great. made them one of the most powerful cards ever made in Magic's history. Got it. Right. Sure. Well, it's an artifact creature beast. It's originally from Darksteel. It costs two mana, and it's a zero zero. It has the following lines of text: Sacrifice an artifact. Colon. Put a plus one plus one counter on Arcbound Ravager and Modular One. Modular, by the way, says that when this comes into play, it comes into play with a plus one plus one counter on it. And when it's put into a graveyard, you may put its plus one plus one counters on target artifact creature. So Let me tell you, the, the first time I ever experienced this card, I was playing Living End and I had taken it to Modern FNM. This, Living End was the deck that got me into Modern. And I'll, I, I, I used to get such joy out of inverting the board, which is what Living End basically does. And I remember the first time I faced Affinity and I was like, oh, this is the Affinity deck I've read about. I'm really excited to play this. And I go to, to Cascade in the Living End and Living End's on the stack. And I was like, hi, Cascade the Living End right here. You're going to lose everything. Ha! And he goes, um, sack everything to Ravager. And it's going to come back. And I was just like, wait, no, no, (laughs) no, no. You can also sacrifice it to exile bridge from below. They love to do that. And the card is the bane of my existence. (laughs) I mean, in a world, in a world where there's a lot of people's banes of their existence. There was, there was damage on the stack when this thing existed. Damage was on the stack. You could say damage on the stack, sacrifice Ravager to do whatever, to save my other guy, to do my thing, and all my triggers, and disciple the vaults killing you and stuff. It's like, it, it's just sort of this weird perfect storm. They made it too cheap. They made the activation for free. It, it has insane synergy with the artifact deck that they essentially gave to you. I mean, like, yep. it's hard to describe how overwhelmingly powerful this stupid card was back in the day. It just, I mean, it's insurance against removal. You know, if you, if you if something gets targeted, you can pitch it, and you're still getting value out of it. If it happens to be a burn spell, you might be able to sacrifice enough things to where it's out of burn range. It single-handedly changes the combat math. Like, if you look at something like Ink Moth Nexus, um, or even just cards by themselves that are terrible, take a Memnite and beef that baby up. Suddenly, it's very scary. Um, pitching artifacts you don't need anymore. You know, if you want to go in for the kill, you don't mind sacrificing everything you have. Um, it, with cards like Walking Ballista, those sort of plus one, plus one counters, it makes those cards very scary. Hangerback Walker, um, pitching a, you can sacrifice the Hangerback Walker after putting. I mean, it's just gross. Like the the doors that this card opens are just just ridiculous. All right, so we have covered our number one. Aaron, what is your number one? <laughs> <laughs> Draft Digger's Cage. No, oh, okay. no, 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 That's no. Not no. A creature, a creature. Um, I know. So okay. my number one is a very recent edition. It's very recently. It came out very recently, and I have experienced an inordinate amount of joy playing with this card. Um, I predicted the card was going to be a hit, and I was really, I, w- I was really banking on this card and hoping to God I wasn't wrong. And thanks to this card, I not only won a vintage challenge, um, but I also proceeded to go undefeated uh, my second night of the Vintage Super League on the back of this card. Uh, this card was the reason that Dredge was predicted to be the boogeyman for Vintage uh, for Eternal Weekend. Um, and it's now also seen play in modern, uh, thanks to Ken Yukihiro. Um, he dominated Pro Tour Bill Bow with uh, thanks to this card. Uh, it is now an archetype in modern, so we're seeing modern dominance and vintage dominance. And I just nothing on this list has made me happier than Hollow One. Um, so Hollow One costs five colorless mana. It's an artifact creature golem. It's a four four. Hollow One costs two less, two colorless less to cast for each card you've cycled or discarded this turn, and then it itself has cycling too. So if you're playing Bazaar Baghdad, it's free. <laughs> um, and nothing says screw you to Graf Digger's Cage like just making free 4-4s and right. crushing um, in the hands of the Black Red Hollow One deck uh, you're able to play something like Goblin Lore spin the wheel <laughs> um, draw three, discard three and whoop just start making a bunch of Hollow Ones um, this card is fantastic and um, I'm so glad to see it getting love I'm so glad that other people have clued into it um, the art is kind of just kind of creepy and sad in a little bit it's basically just an empty sarcophagus just trying to find a body 
to put in itself, I guess. And um, I just love this. And I'm so glad it lived up to expectations. And I just, I remember I was at Pro Tour Bill Bell, and I remember just watching with Hiraria, it was me and the Hiraria coverage people, watching Ken's match and just the randomness of it. And God bless Riley Knight, who really, really injected the enthusiasm into the coverage of that match and playing into the randomness of what's he going to do next? And then, bam, three hollow ones. And it was it was just magnificent to watch. That was one of those, like, the, the Pro Tour match where it really got highlighted and and the fact that it kind of broke out of that pro tour. I mean, I remember watching it and there's just that moment where you're like, Oh, Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> oh God. Dear. Oh, what is he doing? What does Goblin Lore do again? Looking up Goblin Lore. <laughs> Goblin Lore is now a $10 card, by the way. Woo! <laughs> that card is bananas. I it was just like ridiculous. I was like, oh my God, this. And then and it triggers the Phoenix. And it's like, you know, it's just like a beautiful Burning line. Like, you know, calculations show up. And you're like, this card is absolutely amazing. Oh my God. Like, Halloween was great. <sighs> Oh, yeah. we got we got uh, we got lots of great Twitch moments out of it. Most recently, the Matt Nass and Andrew Backstrom um, goblin lore in which they found three hollow ones and yeah. then a street wraith. And we're like, come on, let's get it. Let's get the last <laughs> one. And then they got the last one. And that was delightful. Um, obviously, a Frank Karsten article on math came out as a result. And any card that causes that to happen is great. Yeah, um, yeah hollow one's amazing. And, and it's another one of those cards that it's like it started out as a sideboard plan. And then you were like, what if we just did this as the main deck? What if this was just what we did, right? Like, it's a very similar story to the Shadow Mage Infiltrator uh, Psychotog uh, story or how the original Storm decks that had um, – the standard Storm decks that had Dragon Storm as, like, a sideboard plan were just like, why don't we just do that instead and, like, replace all these stupid black cards with blue cards to find that combo? Um, similar stories along those lines, and I really like Hollow One quite a bit. It's ki- kind of came out of uh, nowhere, and there's – and it's it's really hashtag on brand um, to have number one be Hollow One. <laughs> wow, number one. Well, I mean, and Hollow One right now is a, is a two dollar card, and this is like the perfect type of card because you don't run one Hollow One. You know, right? You yeah. you full play set or You're you in. know Hollow One. There's there's no <laughs> one Hollow One. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, but that that said, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens in the future. That card is terrific. But that was our top 10 artifact creatures. You'll see them on the screen right now for your review. Take a look at my list, Aaron's list, Ruben's top 10. And we want to hear from you about what card we didn't talk about. And we'll select our favorite, the most luxuriant, if you will, mm. to win a $50 gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. There are several we missed. Like I was, there were there were cards I purposely didn't name because I thought you would name them. So the, the field is open. The field is indeed open. But before we go, I want to thank my co-host. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you. And we're going to move on here to our final slide. I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsor, CardOrder.com, my co-hosts, Aaron Campbell and Ruben Bressler, you guys for watching, and hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Visit our website at MagicMicsPodcast.com that exists thanks to our Patreon supporters, or follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe, do everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv slash Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, on Reddit at Reddit.com slash R slash Magic Mics, and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Magic Mics. Talk to us privately at Magic Mics Podcast at gmail.com. Follow the audio-only podcast at, my, <laughs> at Magic Mics podcast.libsend.com almost got through it and find us on itunes or join us here next week for another top 10 episode of magic mics good night everybody <laughs>